Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, model comparison after we talk about the fact that this is Columbia. Columbia gets a lot of grants to develop Stan. Uh, I benefit from those grants somewhat while simultaneously using Stan for business purposes outside of Columbia, and that creates the appearance of a conflict of interest. However, what we're going to be talking about uh, today primarily involves the Lou uh, package, which is primarily developed, not exclusively, nothing is, but primarily at uh, the University of Alto in Finland. Um, but anyway, Columbia doesn't sort of distinguish among the packages uh, or of emphasis. So we've been talking uh, a lot about the sort of Bayesian versus uh, frequentist uh, dispute over most of the 1900s as to what is the appropriate way to analyze uh, data, but probably the more important conflict uh, in this century is between you know, statistical approaches and uh, supervised learning approaches. And so I teach this class in the fall uh, where we go through the sort of data mining uh, approach to things. Um, I'm not really an expert um, on that, but I think I know the basics of it reasonably well to explain it uh, in this context in a slide. So it's always important to think about, you know, what are the goals and what are the technology available at the time and who is responsible for these things. And so with uh, supervised learning, it's been much more influenced by companies, industry, technology companies uh, outside academics than within academics. There's certainly a lot of academic research on these techniques uh, these days, but it's more influenced by computer science departments, engineering departments, uh, operations research, which historically has done a lot of uh, military-related uh, research stuff, and having less to do with uh, statistics. And it came out of the frustration that technology companies had with statistics departments, where people could get master's degrees, they could get uh, PhD degrees, and not have any useful skills uh, for you know working in industry and you know until relatively recently you know these interviews with someone who has like a PhD in statistics would go okay you know what did you do your dissertation research on and be like ah, I developed a new estimator and I derived the distribution of some statistic of you know function of the data across data sets conditional on the true parameters it's like next because that's just not a useless, or that's not a useful skill to have uh, <clears throat> when working in the real world. And that person could have done their PhD without ever having loaded a data set or written any code. Like you could get a PhD in statistics just by doing math. Uh, and you know, again, mostly within the, the frequentist tradition, and uh, part of the reason why they're uh, not so interested in the traditional statistics, or at least the traditional frequentist approach, is that the data sets uh, that these companies are using are typically not random samples from any well-defined population. They don't even define what population uh, they're trying to sample from because they're not trying to sample. What they do is, you know, take a data set, and another important thing to keep in mind about these data sets is they were often collected without having a particular research question in mind as to what they want to answer. You just sort of turn on the like monitoring of your Facebook app or whatever it is, collect all the possible data that you can get, and then figure out what questions you can answer from it uh, after the fact. So. There's certainly no sampling mechanism uh, going on, and, and there's no population either. They just sort of think of the data set as the data set. But uh, when doing a supervised learning exercise, they always split the data, usually randomly, usually into about 80% on the, uh, that's, that should be the other way around. 80% training, 20% uh, testing. Uh, and then they'll solve some sort of a penalized optimization problem using the training data only to get a point estimate of the parameters in the model. 
since uh, their sample is not, you know, or since the data set is not a sample from any well-defined population, the traditional frequentist stuff with, you know, p-values and hypothesis testing doesn't apply in the first place. But moreover, they don't care if you can reject the null hypothesis that some theta is zero in favor of the alternative hypothesis that theta is not zero because they don't actually care about theta except insofar uh, as theta drives the predictions for the outcome in the uh, testing data. So again, I screwed that up. That should be testing here. <clears throat> Predict the outcome in the testing data. And then whatever your measure of success, root mean squared error, classification success, average that over the observations in the testing set, <clears throat> and then repeat it uh, at least you know these steps uh, on the same training and testing uh, data sets as before, but doing it with other models. And so the primary uh, goal here is a prediction of future data. And if that is your goal, then you can modify the optimization problems to be a little bit different from the optimization problems that frequentists were attempting to solve. So they'll add like a penalization function to the likelihood function. And what are the implications of that? Well, <clears throat> the frequentist approach never had as one of its objectives predicting future data well. It was all about making inference about the population parameters. Uh, and so, uh, yes, it's entirely possible that uh, a different objective function would be better, uh, would serve you better uh, when you get the optimum for it if you have different goals. But what uh, statisticians liked about the maximum likelihood estimator, for example, is that across data sets that could be randomly drawn from some population, these you know, estimated thetas only differ in a normal fashion from the true population theta. <clears throat> but if you don't care any about that, you might, you know, modify your optimization problem to be more in line with your goals, and that's where penalization comes in. So the primary focus with these supervised learning uh, approaches is on the decision of which model to use, and you might be estimating like a thousand different models. And so the primary thing that they're worried about is, am I choosing you know, the best one? Uh, not necessarily the right one, but you know, uh, the best one. <clears throat> and from a Bayesian perspective, you might say, well, this splitting into 80% training and 20% uh, testing seems you know, kind of costly. If I'm only using 80% of my observations, then my posterior distribution is going to be less precise than it would be if I were to use 100% of the observations uh, to condition on with like a Bayesian analysis. But from a supervised learning perspective, um, that cost is nothing because you're going to ignore all the uncertainty in the point estimates either way. So you could use 100% of the data, you could use 80% of the data, you could use 50% of the data, and if you just ignore all the uncertainty every time, then you have zero uncertainty. Um, so that cost isn't really uh, there. But because there is no probability uh, backing of the estimator, it's just you know, the solution to some optimization problem, there's no room for taking uh, expectations in order to make some sort of a decision about which model to use that would you know, maximize the expected predictive, however you want to measure it, um, performance. Now, as we've said before, there is uh, clearly an opportunity to bring probability in. <clears throat> this is essentially like Fisher's randomization inference. Instead of assigning you know, some observations to the control group and some observations to the treating group, you're assigning most of the observations to the training data set and like 20% of the observations to the testing data set. But by doing that, you induce a probability distribution over the optima. So which observations could have landed into training and testing is you know, randomized. Uh, so you induce 
a probability distribution of the optima over the splits into training and testing. And consequently, you induce a probability distribution over your predictive success metric, uh, again, over all the ways that you could split the data set um, accordingly. But uh, even though it would be, you know, I, I'd say pretty straightforward to figure out what is the probability distribution of the ultimate, you know, success measure, at least asymptotically, uh, across all the different ways to split into training and testing, you don't see that question asked or answered very often in the supervised learning literature because they just don't care that much about probability or expressing uncertainty um, in, you know, theta estimate, in, you know, what model is like probably best. None of those are questions that are at the forefront of this literature, particularly not in the industry setting. <clears throat> and so what they do is they choose the model uh, that actually predicts best in the testing set for one random split into training and like 20% testing. And I think this is a uh, really instructive way of understanding the difference between the Bayesian approach and the supervised learning approach. From a Bayesian perspective, it's absolutely blindingly obvious that you would want a model that is expected to predict future data the best, taking an expectation. And so that's why you have like all the draws and the posterior distribution. This has basically been known since like Laplace in the early 1800s. Pretty much the last word on it was walled, at least theoretically, in the 1950s. And now we have like computer technology where we can actually do like what the theory says reasonably well. And you know, all of that points to make the decision that maximizes your expected utility, where utility depends on how well you predict the future. Uh, and like that would even be true from a frequentist perspective, although they do their decision analysis in a like weird way. But it's still like maximize expected uh, <clears throat> performance like across data sets or whatever. Uh, but if you talk to someone who's not influenced by statistics and probability, in particular if you're talking to anyone wearing a suit, <clears throat> it is blindingly obvious that you want to choose the model that actually works the best. Not, oh, like give me the model that is expected to be best because they don't even really know the definition of expectation. When you say that in English, they're like, well, it could be a lot worse than what I expect. So I want the model that actually works best in one split into training and testing that was completely random. So from a Bayesian perspective, it's like you're taking one draw of the performance metric and then making all your conclusions based on that one realization that was induced when you split it into to training and testing instead of saying, well, you know, how would I take the expectation over like all of that? <clears throat> and so they're sort of putting all of their eggs in literally one basket. And you know, the testing set is not from the future either. It's from the past. <clears throat> what they really want is something that uh, you know, will work well in future data. But they're just taking this one realization of training and, and uh, in, to training and testing as and to make the testing set, you know, the representation of what they think the future will be. And then instead of, you know, doing something with probability where you take, you know, expectations over all the data sets that could be in the future, they're just like, well, which one actually worked best in this testing set? That's the model that we want to go with for the future. And so I love these situations where you get two sides that think the other is just completely nonsensical. Because then it always goes back to sort of the fundamental principles you start the data analysis with. And then you know, once you learn those, you can really understand 
you know, why there's so much talking past each other. So uh, from a you know, sort of historical sp perspective, supervised learning never got too enthralled with the frequentist definition of probability, nor with any of the like, sampling stuff, you know, none of the p-values, anything like that. But what they kept about the frequentist approach is you maximize or minimize some function, get a point estimate of the parameter theta, and go with that one set of numbers, or at least you know, one set of numbers per model, and then you do this other thing to choose which one model to go with, as opposed to the Bayesian approach where you have a whole posterior distribution of the parameters that you're estimating. Another uh, important difference Mm, we'll get to the other important difference later. Uh, questions about this so far in terms of the differences in perspectives? Yeah. This could just be more like <laughs> talking past everything, but I know very little about machine learning, so hopefully this is a useful question. But like, I get the logic behind like choosing the model that like actually works best in that testing set. But if you're using that to try to predict the future, like how is that useful for like out of sample predictions if they're different from the testing set, right? Like doesn't that rely on the sort of like process to all be? Certainly if the future data that comes in is from a different data generating process than the past data that you've collected or your data generating process is changing over time, the one testing set that you use to decide among a thousand different models <clears throat> might very well be not particularly representative of the future. Uh, that's a problem. But moreover, like what if you just get a weird, like say the data generating process is entirely constant over the interval that you're interested in. What if you just get a weird realization of the testing data? <clears throat> so like, they could fix this problem by just doing like 100 splits into training and testing and do this, get like a distribution over it. It would be probably consistent or whatever. But they're just like, nah, give me one. And so this is the, the sort of thinking that, you know, if they watch the video on homework one, the, like the guy in the suit would be like, Labat made a terrible decision. Like actually Mannion had two aces. So obviously calling was actually the wrong decision to make. He lost almost all his chips. Like, why is this an interesting question? Like, obviously it was a wrong decision. And maybe it was a wrong decision, but from a Bayesian perspective, you have to dig deeper because he actually didn't know what would happen in the future when Mannion turned over his cards. He had to make the decision in the present and you know, take a bunch of expectations as to what, you know, under the independent chip model or whatever, he would be you know, expected to win more money if he were to you know, call than if he were to fall. Um, and from a Bayesian perspective, it's just like, okay, you gotta do some more work here in order to like, actually have decisions that are uh, from a good process. And so, like, if you turn on, like, CNBC or even ESPN, they'll, like, every hour there will be some guy interviewed being like, I am results oriented. And that is stupid because at the time you have to make the decision, you don't know what the results in the future are going to be. So you have to be expectation of results oriented in the way that you make those decisions, but that's not the way it works in the real world. So speaking of real world, classic example of this. Uh, so you know, scientists, if they want to predict the weather, they're going to use physics, they're going to use chemistry, they're going to use ordinary differential equations, they're going to get data on like all these things, the pressure, the temperature, the humidity. Um, <clears throat> but if you're Google, well, you can predict the weather and you can actually do it. B and scientists have gotten way better at predicting the weather in like the past 10, 20 years years. The forecasts for like a week in advance are way, way more accurate uh, than they used to be. But recently Google came out with this thing where they can predict the weather better than scientists for six hour intervals into the future. 
not by using physics, chemistry, or like humidity or any of that data. You just like take a picture of the United States, divide it up into one square, uh, square kilometer blocks, make like different colors for how much it rains there, and then run a neural net over that thing just the same way it like processes images of cats <coughs> and stuff like that. And the neural net will learn that if it you know, rains in one square kilometer block, it tends to rain in the adjacent one square kilometer blocks. And you can get this uh, physics, chemistry, slash science free way of predicting whether it's going to rain. And there are some advantages of this approach. You can uh, get a forecast in like 10 minutes, whereas you know, running an actual scientific model takes hours. You can increase the spatial resolution to like one square kilometer as opposed to five kilometers. And more importantly, if you're Google and you like hook this up to Google Maps, <clears throat> if someone wants to like take a walk or a bike ride or whatever, you can get an actual forecast for your exact route as to how much it's going to rain when. <clears throat> Whereas if you go to like weather.com, it'll say like, there's a 30% chance that it's going to rain in the next hour. Uh, something that's not so specific to your geography. Um, <clears throat> but is this science? Is it useful for science? Is it useful for social science? So places like, in particularly Google, um, but I would say technology companies in general, love this sort of approach that doesn't require you to have a scientific model. It requires you to have a lot of data that's amenable to the sorts of things that Google does well. So like you on your laptop could not do this. Like well, the neural net thing with the whole United States and chopped up into one kilometer things. You need a whole like building worth of servers, you know, talking to each other and you need you know, terabytes worth probably more than that. I don't know what's bigger than exabytes worth of RAM and like the ability to store the data for this image resolution stuff on these, you know, servers and stuff like that. But that's the kind of thing that Google does well and Google gets their hardware relatively cheap compared to the volume of hardware that they're buying. And so, you know, running this neural net thing in parallel across like a thousand different processors and like with all the hardware stuff uh, is the sort of thing that's right up Google's alley where they're like, uh, you know, figuring out a model for the atmosphere sounds hard. But to like the chemist or the physicist, they're like, you know, that's kind of what we do every day. It's not that hard. We're getting better at it sort of thing. But anyway, Google in particular, Hal Varian, who I think works at Google or used to work at Google after having an academic career, you know, kind of said a while ago, and this hasn't panned out totally, but it, it sort of has, that we're sort of getting into a post-model uh, world where you don't like need a theoretical model where like you solve, you know, all this uh, differential equations and stuff like that. You just need data and you just need algorithms that turn data into predictions. Uh, and that is what they managed to do here. But is that a good model? Uh, is there some analogous thing that we could do as social science that would be similarly useful? And it, for me, it's hard to think of what those might be, even though I can acknowledge, you know, for someone who wants a bike ride, they don't really care why it's raining. They might not even care how much it's raining. They just primarily care, like, am I going to get wet? <clears throat> and, you know, am I going to log into this thing with Google Maps so that Google gets, like, more data on where it is that I'm going? And, like, can Google take that fact and then sell advertisements for ponchos when I log into Google Maps and it tells me where I'm going, there's going to be rain in the next 30 minutes. You know, OK, I get why they're doing it. I don't entirely get the fascination with these sorts of approaches for our scientific purposes. <clears throat> so then there's a question. <clears throat> 
what is Bayesian machine learning? Uh, so that is the name of a class that you can take at Columbia. I don't think it's offered in the spring. It's probably offered in the fall. People have gone on from this class <coughs> uh, to take it. Uh, they've had some good and some less good things to say about it, but they still haven't really told me the definition of what is Bayesian uh, machine learning. I think it's a combination of a lot of these things. There's not like there's one consensus definition um, <coughs> as to what it means, but rather several non-exclusive possibilities. And you know, if you just read like a random blog, it's not always clear that they've thought through which of the possibilities that they're referring to. So one maybe way of thinking about Bayesian machine learning is, okay, there's a posterior density, <coughs> but the person doesn't really care about the posterior density over theta, except insofar as the posterior distribution influences the posterior predictive distribution for future data. So if we're interested in getting a density for future data given past data, future data with the tilde, we can do the Bayesian hokey pokey thing where we introduce theta and then integrate it out or you know, do this with draws more realistically on a computer in order to get <coughs> draws that are our predictions for these future data. So this would be, I would say, the most direct uh, parallel between sort of most of what you see that goes under the definition of su uh, supervised learning where they're not using Bayesian techniques at all, just optimization. Okay, you know, we could do this with MCMC and if you don't really care about the posterior and you only sort of care about the posterior because of how it influences the posterior predictive distribution of future data, you know, okay. But, you know, the Bayesian approach never really said you must care about this, you must care about that, or, you know, you don't care about that. So, you know, if you wanted to do this within a Bayesian setting, I think it would be fine. Uh, the second link there goes to a famous uh, book about the sort of Bayesian approach to machine learning, and I think it, it tends to take mostly this um, sort of approach. Another way of thinking about Bayesian machine learning is, okay, we define a posterior distribution. We might use Bayes' rule in order to set up a model, but then when we go to estimate it, we're just going to find the mode and stop rather than doing MCMC to get our you know, uncertainty about theta. <clears throat> Another sort of approach that goes by the name variational inference, try to find, okay, so the denominator of Bayes' rule is impossible to get analytically. Is there some uh, function uh, probability distribution that's known in closed form like a multivariate normal <clears throat> that we can get that's closest to this posterior distribution, and then we can work with the, the easy distri uh, distribution rather than you know, doing all the hard stuff to get draws from the you know, posterior distribution of theta given y. If the posterior distribution of theta given y is close to a multivariate normal, then arguably speaking, we just need to find that multivariate normal, and then if we want to, we can draw a bunch of times from that multivariate normal. So uh, there's a lot of uh, skepticism about MCMC among people who identify themselves as Bayesian machine learners, and they want to use basically any other algorithm besides MCMC in order to do <coughs> uh, the inference. Another way of thinking about it is if, okay, we have some outcome variable y, and then there's a conditional mean function that depends on parameters, it depends on x's, and then some error that's uh, independent of that. Well, could we put a prior on the unknown but continuous function, mu, <clears throat> rather than making a specific assumption that it's linear, or it's got interaction terms, or it's polynomial, or some uh, explicit mathematical form like that. And so that would be uh, basically Bayesian version of neural nets, Gaussian processes, et cetera, where what they're trying to do is figure out what this function that generates the conditional mean is, rather than assuming it takes a particular form and then estimating the parameters of that uh, conditional on the form, like we do with linear models, generalized linear models, et cetera. So we certainly started with that, uh, but to me, this is just Bayesian. Uh, the idea of sort of putting a prior on functions goes by the name Bayesian nonparametrics, uh, 
and people had been talking about it in like the 1970s, uh, before there was much of a supervised learning movement, and certainly before you could really do anything basing on, on a computer about it, but they talked about the theory uh, of it, uh, and they just thought of themselves as being Bayesian, and there's no real need to bring in ideas of machine learning. Finally, uh, maybe, it, you know, sort of taking a Bayesian approach uh, philosophically, but coming up with estimation methods that are intended to scale well with the size of the data <coughs> as opposed to with the complexity of the model. So make it work with like a large number of observations, make it work with a large number of predictors, but continue to estimate relatively simple models like least squares, penalized least squares, logit, something like that. Anyway, uh, from my perspective, uh, like the Bayesian part of Bayesian machine learning is much more uh, important than the machine learning part. <clears throat> and uh, I've been, uh, although continually surprised by how well uh, Stan works for doing MCMC. I've been at the same time uh, surprised in the other direction by how little interest there is from like the computer science community into improving the Stan approach to MCMC. They all, most of them, uh, just kind of dismiss MCMC from the start as being um, impractical at least for the data sets that they have in mind. But again, that is mostly based on their experience with Gibbs samplers, Metropolis Hastings, which uh, did not work particularly well. Um, so one of the things that the supervised learning uh, approach is really worried about is overfitting. And this is mostly in reaction to uh, frequentist ways of doing the estimation, where particularly for maximum likelihood, it really overfits the existing data or the training data by construction. So a maximum likelihood estimator, lots of people think, well, that must mean it's the value of theta that is most likely, uh, which again is not even a correct statement from a frequentist perspective. What maximum likelihood estimator really means is the value of the parameters such that the most likely data set of size n to randomly draw from a population is the data set that you actually drew. And so it, from that perspective, every other potential data set that could have been drawn from this population is going to fit worse than the data set that you actually have. And so if you use maximum likelihood estimation, uh, methods of estimation, you're always going to get predictions in the uh, training data that fit the observed outcome in the training data better than what's going to happen with the testing data, or at least an expectation. Um, and so the, the people who are doing uh, data mining and supervised learning stuff, one say, well, you can't just use raw maximum likelihood estimation. You need to penalize the, the function somehow uh, in order to get better predictions <coughs> in the testing data. And then the other thing that is really fundamental to, to their approach is that you have to evaluate the models <coughs> based on the testing data, where the testing data was not used at all in the process of uh, doing the optimization problem to obtain your point estimate of theta. So you have to keep those completely separate. And when deciding which of your 1,000 models to use, you have to use you know, clean data <clears throat> because that is going to give you a better indication as to how well this is going to uh, work on future data than the performance of the predictive measure in the training data, which is not relevant at all uh, because it's going to be you know, overfitting the, the data that was used in the optimization problem almost by construction. So those are the main two things they do, penalization and separation of, of training into testing. What they won't tell you, but I will, <clears throat> is that the overfitting phenomenon that they have uh, rightly pointed out about maximum likelihood estimation is primarily, not exclusively, 
not saying exclusively, but I am saying primarily, and I'm saying it very loudly, <coughs> due to the choice to use optimization as your estimation method to just get one single value of theta that's a solution to the optimization problem and completely ignore all of your uncertainty about it. If you take the Bayesian approach, use Stan, use MCMC, get draws from the posterior distribution and average your fit method over all of the draws instead of using you know, the one point that minimizes the sum of squared errors in the training data or maximizes the likelihood, you know, same thing basically, uh, then you should not be badly overfitting the data that you conditioned on. And even if you are, you should know it. So from the sort of Bayesian perspective, <clears throat> the primary reason you have overfitting is because you used optimization rather than MCMC as your estimator. But <clears throat> given that you're hell-bent on using optimization to get a single you know, point estimate of theta, then you're like, well, we have to do all these things. We have to penalize the objective function. We have to split into training and testing, not use all of the data so we can keep some of it clean to evaluate all these other models that doesn't really address the root problem uh, or the root cause of the overfitting thing, which is your ignoring of all the uncertainty. And that can be addressed pretty directly from a Bayesian perspective by just considering all of your uncertainty. But even with that, uh, overfitting can still be somewhat of a problem uh, when doing the Bayesian approach. And when it is, it's often due to improper priors or just crazy weak priors like normal with mean zero and uh, standard deviation of like a billion. You know, you'll see people <clears throat> doing that, priors that no one believes in the first place but they essentially provide like no prior information, in which case, uh, you know, the Bayesian analysis is not that different numerically uh, from a maximum likelihood analysis and you can get some of that overfitting. So problem mostly goes away if you acknowledge your uncertainty or it doesn't go away. It was just not that big a problem in the first place if you acknowledge your uncertainty. <clears throat> Whatever's left tends to go away if you put, you know, halfway reasonable priors on the parameters. And to the extent it's still a problem, from a Bayesian perspective, if you're going to split into training and testing, you should have n minus one observations in the training data and one observation in the testing data. Obviously, there's n ways to do that. But from a Bayesian perspective, you know, the more data I condition on, the better the posterior distribution is. So I really want to be using all the observations that I have, but I might hold out grudgingly one of them uh, to get the inference. Do you have a question mark? Uh, is the issue of using improper priors also related to defaults? Like, is that like something that comes up like if you like use the default when it's wildly inappropriate? Uh, you know, the defaults, particularly in our stand arm, there's sort of intended to be reasonable for a wide class. They're not like crazy normal. They're like normal 2.5 standardized as opposed to like 2.5 billion or something like that. Um, so yeah, I, you can always do better than the defaults in R stand arm. Although what would be better may not be supported by R stand arm. But if you write your own stand program, like you can always do better than my defaults, which had no idea about your data. Um, but what I want to mostly I impress upon you is that you don't have to accept the rules that the supervised learning people created for themselves to mitigate a problem that is almost entirely self-inflicted. You know, if you talk to anyone in a suit, they're like, why didn't you split your data into training and testing? Like, you have to do that, otherwise it's going to massively, you know, overfit. And it's like, no, I'm coming at this from a different perspective where, you know, those things are considerations, but they're not something that you have to obsess about or make, like, blanket rules as to how to deal with it that only make sense in your world 
in your world does it actually make that much sense either? <clears throat> Think about the uh, Bayesian overfitting in the Einstein arm uh, in, I think it was like Stan LM or whatever, we only specify the R squared. And sure, the R squared can be obviously or should be informed by the priors, but you don't really have much wiggle room to do something not to overfit, I think. Well, of that uh, next. Oh, question. Uh, with the previous example, let's imagine that yes. So we're doing that and something goes wrong and a person should, goes to us and says, oh, you just chose an improper prior, like something was wrong with your prior, that's why the model failed. How do we explain that? Because we don't have, still, we still don't have anything to determine our prior, right? Well, uh, you really should not be using improper priors ever. Um, Incorrect, not improper. Oh, okay, so like crazy, weird, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I, I always kind of favor addressing the problem at the root. Um, so if the problem is like you put a prior on a regression coefficient in a Logit model that's like, you know, normal zero, a thousand, um, that's kind of a self-inflicted deal. Um, Bring up for that. Uh, so back in the uh, 2008 presidential election between uh, Barack Obama and John McCain, if you looked at the exit polls uh, among white people, there was kind of high 30 percent support for Obama uh, against McCain, and sort of regardless of any other variable that you might have in your model. If you switch that person from white to black, then there's probably 98, 99% chance that they would favor Obama. And so just switching this one variable changed the probability by about 0.6. And that is like the biggest effect in the history of social science. <clears throat> And it, it, you know, a change in the probability of 0.6 would probably correspond to a change in the log odds of like three or four. So like the coefficient on the are you white or are you black variable in that model for Obama versus McCain, who do you support, would have a coefficient of like three or four. <clears throat> and that's the biggest effect that you could get from a dummy variable, reasonably speaking, in social science. And yet you will still see people being like, oh, you know, I want to be weakly informative, and so I'll put a normal zero a million prior on that coefficient, where you know we've never seen one, you know, historically greater than four. And really, you know, if it goes past ten or negative ten, it's gonna overflow the probability to one or zero. So there really is, like in practice, a pretty narrow range as to what the coefficients in a logit model could be that is massively violated by a lot of the priors that you see people use. And it's just, okay, you know, draw from the prior predictive distribution, see that this is putting all the probability on either zero or one, and then don't do that. <clears throat> but anyway, so, Another thing that you'll see people say is, well, you know, supervised learning and Bayesian are pretty similar because the penalization functions that supervised learning are using are very similar to the prior functions that Bayesians use. And so the, the fit function is usually, you know, proportional to a log likelihood, and then they're going to add this penalization function to the extent that the coefficients are different from zero. And these penalty functions often correspond to some prior conditional on a hyperparameter lambda. But they're going to have different approaches to dealing with this unknown hyperparameter lambda. The supervised learning approach is to fix it to some lambda to like 0.75, solve the optimization problem, you know, predict out of sample, <clears throat> and then you know, play around with the value of lambda, induce you know, the, the solution for the rest of the coefficients, get the predictions, and sort of play around with it until you find a value of lambda that predicts best in the testing data. 
Whereas the Bayesian approach would be, we'll put a prior on lambda and draw from its joint distribution with beta and sigma and whatever other parameters in your model, along with everything else using Stan, uh, of course. This would not work well with Gibbs sampling, but you can see for all of these you know, penalty functions that you hear talked about in supervised learning courses, there's some prior that uh, is basically has the same kernel as that penalty function that you could use, um, although it's usually not that advisable. So if we take the example of Lasso, which until fairly recently was one of the more popular supervised learning estimators, well, they're minimizing this function that depends on the squared error um, you know, uh, left over when you have alpha and beta. And then there's this penalty function that depends on lambda and the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients. And this can be thought of as, okay, we have a Gaussian likelihood with sigma equal to one fixed for some reason. And we have independent Laplace priors on the coefficients with location zero and some inverse scale lambda. So the Laplace prior, the kernel of it, depends on the absolute value of its argument. And you could actually motivate the Laplace, otherwise known as double exponential distribution. It's the maximum entropy distribution for a given expected absolute value of the coefficients. You just set that equal to one over lambda. Uh, and then you have a, a maximum entropy approach to choosing that prior. And the posterior mode, if you take the Bayesian approach, is going to correspond to the lasso uh, solution, at least for a given lambda. Um, like I said, they're mostly not concerned about any sort of probability stuff, although two of the like many Tipsharanis uh, in the past couple of years did uh, post a paper for the sampling distribution of the lasso estimator, but conditional on a given sparsity pattern, which seems to kind of uh, beg the question in my mind. So this is why I think is an important uh, graph for understanding this thing. This comes from a logit model, has no intercept, one predictor, not that many data points. Uh, the, uh, all of these uh, densities are normalized, which is to say they integrate to one, but the vertical axis here is in log units, so it doesn't always look like that, but that's true. So we have the likelihood function in red. Uh, for these data, which are simulated. And if you wanted to be frequentist, well, you would get the maximum likelihood estimator, which is just a little bit less than two. It's the value of the coefficient such that the likelihood function is the highest. And so like a little less than two would be the answer that you go forward with, you know, as far as whatever you're doing, your inferences. Maybe you like try to test whether you can reject the null hypothesis that it's really zero, but anyway, you get this point estimate of a little bit less than two. Now, although this lasso stuff is primarily motivated to give better predictions for future data, some kind of more statistically minded people have said, well, if testing the null hypothesis is that the thing is zero is like not a good way to proceed, well, we can use this lasso approach and see if at the optimum, some of the coefficients are either exactly zero or they're not. And so we can use the fact that is the optimum, you know, exactly zero for some of those co coefficients to decide whether the coefficient is or is not zero, you know, based on where it is at the optimum. So if you look at the penalized uh, lasso uh, function for this logit model, that is in the black line there. And because it's not differentiable at zero, a lot of times the mode of, uh, or the optimum, the supremum of this function is going to be at zero, which it is in this case. So this is an example where lasso is essentially thrown away your only predictor because it's saying, you know, we'll tend to get better uh, predictions of future data if we don't use this predictor, if we take it out of the model. Now, if you do the Bayesian approach, which is sort of to combine the, the Bernoulli likelihood with the Laplace prior, which takes the same, which it has the same kernel, 
as the L1 penalty function used by Lasso, then you get a posterior distribution that is the blue line there. <clears throat> the posterior mode, again, is at zero. Um, so, right, so the frequentist maximum likelihood solution is a little bit less than two. The supervised learning solution, it's zero. And then the Bayesian solution is, well, it's the whole blue curve. Yes, the mode of this posterior distribution is zero, but the mean of it, I don't know what it is, it's gonna be not zero, some positive number. The median of the blue is gonna be some non-zero number. In general, the whole curve is the answer, and we're not gonna get overly focused on any one point, even if that's the mode. So this illustrates the, the coinciding of the lasso solution with a posterior mode for some prior. But, and you know, lasso people say, oh, well, that makes lasso Bayesian or whatever. No, <clears throat> the posterior distribution, the whole thing is the critical part to the Bayesian analysis of it. And you know, if we want to do something important with this, we want to average over all that uncertainty in the blue curve rather than saying, okay, let's just get one number and go with it. But if you take the perspective that like optimization is the only way to estimate these things, then you get dragged into this debate as to, well, what's the right function to be optimizing in order to get our one number? Is it just the likelihood function, in which case the one number is like 1.9? Or is it the penalized likelihood function, in which case the number is zero? Well, the basic issue here is you should not be putting everything on one number estimates. You should have a probability distribution that reflects your beliefs about all the possible things that beta could be. So that's that. And you can see the code that I did. So penalty functions, uh, they do correspond to priors generally bad priors because the motivations for those penalty functions were just to shift the mode because you know they don't care about any of this stuff in the tails or anything like that the motivation for the lasso penalty function is to shift the mode from like 1.9 to zero generally shifting the mode back toward the origin tends to give better predictions for future data because you've counteracted the tendency of maximum likelihood to overfit. Oh, question. Um, so forgive me if I don't understand this correctly, but could this logic model apply to that mortgage data set that we looked at in data mining last, last term? Uh, in which uh, like they accept or reject? Oh, the, the application? Yeah. Yes. So how would, so I remember you said something similar to um, the best answer was to reject the applicants. How would the Bayesian oh, okay, approach yeah. be different? Yeah. yeah. So in that particular example, people who weren't in the class, uh, when you ran through and you did like the, the elastic net or something like that model, and then you made classifications in the testing data, it uh, gave you a corner solution where it said no one gets a loan to buy a house. <clears throat> and that was right 90% of the time because 90% of the people who applied for loans didn't get them. But 10% did. And so it was, a, it was a solution that sort of got the highest number of correct classifications in the testing data, but one that is sort of uh, stupid solution from the perspective of a mortgage lender. Like if you're lending money for people to buy houses and stuff like that, your analytics team should not be coming back with a prediction that says no one ever gets a loan because then you don't have a business plan. <laughs> uh, from a Bayesian perspective, we would get the posterior predictive distribution and so, yeah, we might be drawing from a probability distribution that's like 0.9 chance that you don't get it, 0.10 chance 
0.1 that you do, but over a whole bunch of draws from the posterior distribution will correctly pick up the fact that approximately 10% of the people are getting the loan. So that, it's, it's on the same line as don't get too caught up with your one uh, estimate that ignores all your uncertainty. And then when you do the classifications and the testing data, don't just say, okay, is this greater than or less than 0.5? And then that's how I'm gonna classify it. Draw from a Bernoulli distribution with whatever the implied posterior probability is. And if you're drawing from a Bernoulli distribution, even with probability 0.9 of failure, like 0.1 of success, you know, and you do that over a whole bunch of observations, a whole bunch of draws, well, 10% of them are gonna come up as yeses. And so that is, yeah, way more reasonable than what the solution to that homework uh, was. Uh, anyway, these penalty functions, people say they're priors, not so much. Because as a penalty function, they're intended to shift the mode in order to prevent overfitting. From a prior, if you think of them as priors, you have to think about, well, how do they also affect the tails? Uh, like the whole distribution, not just the mode. And they often affect the tails in a very like weird and extreme way. And that has more consequences for posterior mean, posterior variance, et cetera. So there's probably better priors that you can choose and we'll start to learn more about those next week. Uh, obviously the Bayesian approach is really obsessed about keeping track of the uncertainty, uh, whereas supervised learning uh, basically ignores it at, at every juncture. And for the Bayesians, you really want to condition on all the available information that you have rather than putting so much into testing. And you know you don't want to fix lambda to any particular value and then do all your analysis conditional on that. Rather, you want to put a prior on these hyperparameter things and draw from the posterior distribution along with all of the other unknowns. So to this diamonds data set, uh, if we estimate the same model, that we did before, get the posterior distribution, call posterior predict to draw from the posterior predicted distribution. In this, uh, I did draw is equal to 1,000. So I get a matrix that's 1,000 by n. And then if I want to uh, assess the overfitting, I can calculate on a column by column basis on this posterior predicted distribution, you know, what's the 25th uh, percentile? what's the 75th percentile? My model implies there's a 0.5 chance that any observed outcome is gonna be between these two things, although they differ from one column to the next. So then if I evaluate this function uh, column-wise as to whether the actual log price uh, falls between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, that comes out to be true 53% of the time. And this is what I was saying you know, before, often happens. Yeah, you can overfit a little bit. A 50% interval should contain 50% of the observations, not 53% of the observations. So I ran a little bit too hot here, but not that much and I know about it. And you know, maybe if I did some stronger priors or, or something like that, I could you know, get it closer to, to 50. So it's not like, oh, well, I had to take away you know, 10,000 of these points and put them in testing in order to like, determine that, one, I didn't overfit that much, but two, like, I can tell just from the data I conditioned on, which was like, all of it. And honestly, like 53%, it's not that big a deal. Because I average over my uncertainty in the posterior predicted distribution. If I just like did the posterior mode and went with that one number, then it would probably show up as like badly overfitting and I wouldn't be able to make a calculation like this to tell, it would just work badly with future diamonds. So from a Bayesian perspective, there's really no excuse you have to badly overfit the data that you conditioned on. 
that's sort of a fact of life with maximum likelihood, and really a kind of a fact of life with ma uh, penalized maximum likelihood, but it's mitigated by the penalization. If you're Bayesian, you shouldn't overfit the data you have. Like, if this was 63, I'd be worried. But I'm worried about other things, really, more than 53. Yes? Uh, I was wondering, so what is, what is the margin here? Like, why is the margin equals 2? That means column-wise. So okay. across all observations on the posterior predicted distribution, find the 25th percentile, find the 75th percentile. The actual data value that we observed once we throw away the nonsense observations has a, should, under the model, have a 0.5 chance of landing between those lower bound and upper bound, and a 25% chance of being too higher than that, and a 25% chance of being lower than that. And I can verify all that because I had a probability distribution, not just one number. And uh, so like here, okay, this model turns out is actually very good, but let's say we find out that we, we do um, overfit, then we would just go back to the R squared, like that's the only parameter that we sort of... It would be better to illustrate an example that's actually like more of a problem, but we'll do one of those, probably Thursday. All right, uh, so rolling on, uh, if you're Bayesian, the right utility function to have for future predictions, assuming you just sort of care about predictive accur accuracy, is the log predictive density function for future data. <clears throat> and from a Bayesian perspective, like I was saying at the beginning, what you want to do is choose the model that maximizes the expectation over that, uh, of that uh, utility function over future data. And so this is what's known as the expected log predictive density, ELPD. It's the expectation of the logarithm of the density function for n future observations conditional on n past observations. And so that can be defined as the logarithm of this uh, integral. <clears throat> but it can be estimated, approximated, by the sum of the logarithm of the predictive distribution for the nth, little n, nth observation, conditional on all the observations but the nth. And there's n different ways to leave out one. And so in summations in this uh, term here. And with the Bayesian hokey pokey, the predictive distribution of the nth uh, value conditional on all but the nth value, you know, we introduce theta, we integrate it out, we take logarithms. In practice, this is done with draws, but, you know, conceptually, that is the posterior predictive distribution for the nth observation that I actually observed, but I'm only conditioning on all the other observations. So I'm leaving out one, basically to have a testing set of one observation but there's n different testing sets that I can make that leave out one. OK. So uh, this piece here is just the likelihood contribution of the nth uh, observation. And so can we get this other term, the posterior distribution of theta, conditional on all but the nth observation? Could we get that from the posterior distribution conditional on all the observations. Otherwise, we're going to have to refit our model n different times to get n different posterior distributions. Something would probably go wrong, even with Stan. And so the answer to that question is yes, we can obtain the posterior distribution conditional on all but the nth observation from the con uh, posterior distribution conditional on all observations under the assumption, which is reasonably verifiable, that the nth observation doesn't have an unduly large influence on the posterior distribution. So how do we do that? Uh, that involves, from the reading, these so-called uh, importance ratio uh, functions, which uh, can be evaluated by taking one over uh, the likelihood function evaluated at the sth draw from the posterior distribution when you use MCMC fitting a generalized Pareto model, so we learned the, the non-generalized Pareto on that homework, there's a generalization of that 
uh, density that adds uh, additional parameter. But anyway, you still have this one over k business <coughs> in the exponent there, which is the shape parameter of this generalized uh, Pareto distribution. And so basically, you fit this Pareto uh, to these importance ratios, and you use this interpolated estimate of the importance ratio in the tail that reduces a lot of the variance in this estimator without introducing too much bias. And this is all done for you, so you don't really need to understand the details of this uh, too much. And that is going to work well, provided that the estimated uh, exponent in this uh, Pareto distribution is not too large. So what does not too large mean? Well, certainly anything less than 0.5 is good. It means central limit theorem applies. Uh, if it's between 0.5 and 0.7, the mean exists, so it's going to be OK. Uh, but the convergence of the estimator might be a little bit slower. If it's above 7, particularly if it's above 1.0, uh, the moments don't even exist. So there's nothing. Uh, these importance ratios have infinite variance, and it, it doesn't work well at all. Um, so uh, to illustrate this with a logit model, uh, using data from the 2000 election, presidential election between uh, George Bush and Al Gore uh, and, and Pat Buchanan from the Reform, uh, Reform Party. So uh, we get that data set. I'll put it up on Canvas, um, filter it down to the year 2000. This data set was talked about in the reading. The reading will often do, you know, like income categories one through five, treat those as continuous. Uh, don't do that. Treat it as a factor. Also, you need to get in the habit of putting reasonable units on age uh, and other variables like that. So the expected difference in probability between two otherwise similar people who are one year apart in age is like too small to even think about. And so what I tend to do with age is put it in decades rather than years. And now we're saying, OK, what's the expected difference in the probability that someone supports Bush versus Gore uh, among two otherwise identical people that are 10 years apart. Then like the coefficient is maybe big enough that I can think about putting a prior on. Anyway, just estimate a regular GLM for uh, do you favor Bush with age and age squared and you know the income categories, are you white? I'll just use the default priors here. And so I'll use <coughs> QR equal true for that. I call the loo function that, uh, on the thing that results from that. And I get no warning messages at all. And I get expected log predictive density estimate, you know, the thing on the previous two slides, of negative 575. Now, that does not mean a whole lot in isolation. What is relevant, uh, more relevant, is the difference for this model versus another model that I might estimate. Is that other model achieving an expected log predictive density that's better than this model? So this is negative 575. You might observe that the Lu IC is exactly negative 2 times that, and it is. So don't think this is telling you any like separate information. However, this Lu IC is in the same units as other information criteria that people are more familiar with like AIC, DIC, WAIC, that you'll see people, even for frequentist things, using to decide which one. Those are all worse than Lu IC in one way or another. So all you have to do is either use Lu IC and favor the model that has a lower Lu IC, or I think it's easier to just say expected log predicted density, and I tend to choose the model that has a higher value of that, even though it's negative. So just in relative terms. Also, in the middle here, we have p lu, which is an estimate of the effective number of parameters. So you'll see a lot in frequentist things, people like counting parameters and degrees of freedom. That's all a red herring from a Bayesian perspective, because it doesn't take into account the fact of prior information being supplied here. So I could have a model that has like a million coefficients if on all of those million coefficients, I put a prior that's like normal with standard deviation 0.0001, then I'm basically saying those are constants. They just have like 
a little bit of prior variance. So all of these uh, things that, you know, if you have no uh, prior information used, like in a frequentist model, then you can just count them like integers. From a Bayesian perspective, you have to take into account that, you know, even though this thing is a variable, you could have a prior that is like more concentrated or less concentrated about them. So when we count up estimated parameters, they're no longer integers exclusively. They essentially have a real number estimate uh, of the effective number of parameters being estimated, and it comes out to be 8.2. And you can interpret this as saying, we're getting like about the same amount of uncertainty as to how well this would predict future data from this model as we would uh, with a model that had like 8.2 coefficients and no prior information at all being supplied on it. So this is actually pretty similar to the nominal number of parameters, but that won't be the case once we get to more complicated hierarchical models. So we need to have something to compare this negative 575 with. Oh, question? Yeah. The QR true things doing in the code here? I explained it a little bit on Campus Wire. It's the same as in the Stan LM, except we're not putting a prior on the R squared. We're putting a prior on the coefficients. But it's still using that QR decomposition thing. We'll talk about that for real once we cover matrix algebra after spring break. So it's, from this perspective, it's just trying to get you better efficiency of the effective sample size in Stan. Um, okay, so that was a model before that had like age and age squared. What if we say, okay, the log odds of favoring uh, Bush over Gore is some smooth function of age without saying like it's a particular polynomial or it's linear or whatever. And these smooth functions can be estimated as the summation of uh, many basis functions whose coefficients have normal priors and uh, with an expectation of zero. And the standard deviation on those normal priors is itself unknown and estimated along with everything else in Stan. So if you just called that like lambda, this would be an example of getting a joint distribution over the parameters and the hyperparameters that we then draw from the posterior distribution of. And so that can be accomplished with Stan GAM4 using the same uh, smooth function indicators as in the MGCV package. And we get back this posterior distribution we call Lou on it, and it's now negative 573.3. And the effective number of parameters is a little bit lower. Now you don't want to just eyeball that. There's actually a compare models where you can give it two or more models and it'll actually calculate the difference in expected log predicted density and give you an estimated standard error for that um, across future data sets. So this is a somewhat frequentist thing. Uh, but anyway, so here we have a ratio of four. We're saying this second model is expected to predict future data somewhat better than the first model. And so if that was the only thing that we cared about, we would prefer the second model, but that doesn't take into account other costs, like it may be easier for you to explain to your audience, like a quadratic model, than this thing where it can be like a spline that's intended to represent you know, any smooth function of age. And this is the case despite the fact that it doesn't seem like age is making a whole lot of difference in this particular election. So along the horizontal axis here, we have uh, age in decades. And on the vertical axis here, we have the posterior distribution of the unknown function. And as you can see, there's a lot of uncertainty about it. This data set is not huge. But at the sort of median of the uh, smooth function of age, it seems as if it slightly increases up till you know someone is about 35 or whatever. So you get a little bit more likely to favor Bush. And then at some point, it turns around and starts to trend negative. Uh, older people fearing that you know would have their social security privatized or something more likely favor uh, the Democratic candidate Al Gore. But basically, there's not a whole lot going on with age. And there's a whole lot of uncertainty. But that's correct uncertainty. It's saying we really don't know 
uh, how much age and how age is affecting. But you know, our median is, is somewhat like the middle of our guess. In contrast, if we go back to the diamonds model and we call Lou on that, we'll get these warnings saying five observations found where this Pareto K thing was greater than 0.7. And then it'll give you some recommendations as to what to do with it. But you can also see you know, what are the points that they're not necessarily wrong, but they have an outsized influence on your posterior distribution. So we can't just account for them like what would happen if we left it out with like a little bit of important sampling reweighting. We have to actually leave out observation 2459, refit the model again, and then see how well it predicts. So this recommendation thing that it'll do, it'll re-estimate your model like six times, five times, whatever, um, instead of re-estimating your model n times. Each time, it'll just leave out one of these observations and then see how well the fit, um, posterior predictive fit for those uh, works. But from experience, I can tell you when like 50,300 something are all like real low in their Pareto case, and five or six are way too high, almost always these data points are messed up. Uh, and so you should be double checking you know, whether they were coded correctly, maybe a negative sign got put in there or you know, the decimal points are off by 10 or something like that. So very good chance if you scrutinize these data points, you will find data entry errors um, because you really shouldn't have like individual observations that are having that big an effect on the posterior distribution when you have a well-fitting model and like over 50,000 data points. Okay, out of time. We'll talk about the homework on Thursday. We'll talk about more stuff that you can do with visualization and diagnostics and uh, stuff like that using uh, some of the packages that we've developed, but continuing to build on this idea of leave one out, one observation out, cross-validation. Okay, see you then.